the coffee break was long enough to be able to have some chats and to refresh a bit. And we are ready for the, for the second panel. Uh, as you can see in your programs, it's called How to Implement a Co Managing System in the EU. So it's, it's the same approach as before, but from a more practical side to see what exactly could be done and again to see how to stimulate the afternoon working groups. Um, the program you have in front of you has changed slightly when it comes to the speakers we have here. And therefore, I will invite the current president of IG Europe, Luis Alvarado Martinez, to start this panel. Uh, Luis will give us uh, a short introduction to the co management, uh, also to make sure that the later on discussions are understood uh, on a higher level. And uh, also, he will give us a short overview of the advisory council and with, on the, of the council. Please. Okay, yes, thank you very much, Marco. Uh, I will uh, talk a bit about co management. Please, uh, Mr. Lan or Giuseppe, if I say something crazy, uh, interrupt me. And yes. Um, so, in Asia, we were very interested in this topic because we've seen uh, how it, it works, especially from the outside uh, within the Council of Europe. We, saw, we thought it was very interesting. Of course, then it's uh, inside, it will have different technicalities and a lot of things have to be improved. But it, for us, it's nice because it puts young people more or less on the same level or it gives them a bigger chance when it comes to decision-making. Decision so we started thinking about this and then we started drafting a, a, our own position of, okay, would it be possible to have this inside the, the European Union as well? Um, so we were looking into the, the model which the Advisory Council has, as Maria explained before, so 30, uh, 30 representatives, 20 of them elected at the General Assembly of the European Youth Forum because it's the representative youth platform that we have in, in Europe, and then 10 of them uh, appointed or, or selected by the Secretary General. So then we started thinking, okay, how could we do it in Europe? How would we be able to do it? Would we have like also a body uh, elected also inside the European Youth Forum, partly and also outside for the members which are not in the Youth Forum, which I guess would make some sense as we have this platform which represents all of us. Um, which kind of bodies would we like to be present and taking our voice even in which we, are, we always, when we uh, mention the office and we talk about this, in which tables would we like to be present when the decisions are made? Uh, would we like to be in the European Commission when, when all the more technical aspects are discussed, when the Youth in Action program and the next educational youth program is decided? Is it enough for them to consult us or do we want to be in the table actually making the decisions with them? Uh, do we want to have a seat? as the youth sector in the uh, meetings of the council because these are the really, really big important meetings that, where they discuss budgets and then they discuss and yeah, we understand that maybe at the levels of the council it's very much to ask for a vote or anything but just to have the possibility to express an opinion from the youth sector inside the meeting of the council would already be something very big but what's the role of the parliament in this? Is it necessary for us to have a um, a uh, role, a more, uh, more significant role inside the parliament as well when it comes to youth. So all these questions are the ones that we want you to tackle uh, in the different workshops so we can start with th this discussion. We understand that because the process, as uh, was mentioned in the, in the other panel, the processes of the European Union are slow. But um, we wanted to organize this event to start putting this topic on the table and to start discussing for future prospects what would we like to see as the youth sector. Then of course we will have to find compromises but if we can already start drafting and already identifying what is it that we want, it would be very, very nice. So, yes, uh, I think I will leave my intervention for that for now, and then maybe come later with uh, more points. Uh, yeah. Thank you very much. <coughs> for the intervention, I hope that uh, the system is a bit more clear for you. Uh, we will continue with the Finnish example of uh, how the co-management could work from the Finnish National Youth Council, or sort of youth council we have here, Kaisu Sovangi. Uh, she is the member of the International Committee of Aliasi. Uh, Kaisu, the floor is yours. Okay, thank you. So I'm here to go back to the national level and give you an example of how the uh, youth committee is working in Finland. So uh, in Finland, there's this section youth law which says that young people have to be heard when making decisions concerning them. So this is, of course, where we always, we try to point out if the youth aren't heard. 
so the youth councils represent youth in the municipalities decision making process. So there are non-partisan groups of young people who work in their own municipalities running in the interest of young people. Uh, so their mission is to make youth opinion heard and make statements and initiatives in the municipalities decision making structures. Um, so the youth councils also aim to promote young people's democracy education and to inform youth about the political decision making and help them to find ways how to influence it. Uh, they are either democratically chosen by elections or so that in some smaller municipalities anyone interested can join them. Uh, so most of the members are from 13 to 18 years old and the number of the members in each uh, also depends on the municipality's size and the uh, like um, of the structure. Uh, in some municipalities, the youth council consists of five people, and in some bigger cities, it can be up to sixty people. Um, the oldest youth councils have worked since the middle of nineties, and nowadays there are youth councils in seventy percent of the municipalities in Finland. So. Quite a big amount of them. Uh, the models of how the councils work differ a lot depending on the municipality and its administrative structure. And this is well, it's a bit of a challenge for us, since like it will of course um, makes a difference on of the amount of power that the youth councils actually have. Uh, so they can either work under the municipality's board or under the council or the youth council can be a part of the municipality's youth department. Mm, so in best cases they work actively with the municipality's poli politically appointed youth affairs committee. Mm, well, as I said, the amount of the actual power that youth committees have varies a lot. In some municipalities the youth council has a right to attend and a right to speak in the meetings of the politically appointed uh, municipalities youth affairs committee and in some municipalities they can attend meetings of any committee in the municipality structure when they are working with an agenda that is connected to youth. Um, so the youth councils have an important role on representing the youth so they can like tell the opinion of the young people and give initi initiatives, statements so on. Uh, in many municipalities, they can also, like, when they are working with the um, with the youth affairs committees, they can actually be affecting the situations when doing budgets and so on. Um, and of course, they also give young people experience on inflation matters that are close to their own life. Uh, However, the role is often nominal, and audience would like give the youth actual power and involve them in the decision making process from the beginning, <coughs> so that the youth's voice would be heard already when the actions, budgets, and so on are, are being planned. So, audience's role is to get the youth councils in every municipality, they're still 30% lacking, and make them work efficiently and try to gain actual power for them in the political decision making process. Um, of course also in Finland there are different active student governments <coughs> both in secondary schools and in the higher education. They often cooperate with the youth council and other young people's groups who can also take part in the political decision making. Um, in Alliance we hope that uh, young people hear from all different levels that they are, um, so that the decision makers would hear both youth councils, student governments, youth community centers, etc. Uh, we're also hoping there would be a platform in the internet uh, for the youth to make initiatives that would actually be considered then in the municipality councils. Um, uh, there's this national union of youth councils that coordinates the national youth representative body that consists of one young person from every municipality, and they work with the national issues and represent the Finnish youth in the parliament. Uh, and this NUVA also organizes trainings for the young politically appointed municipal co 
councillors, of which there are about two or three hundred in the land, depending how you count. But, yeah. Mm -hmm. I think that's it. Shortly, something about that. I don't know if you've got anything from that. Uh, basically, but it's really hard to explain how it works. And it's like in some municipalities, it work, works really well, and the young people are actually heard into committees, and they have power there. In some cases, they can even vote there. But then, it depends. <coughs> Thank you very much, guys. Uh, I believe that from from sharing of best practices and experiences we all have is the best way how we can learn from each other and then see what what besides of somebody's way of working can also be beneficial for us and implemented on different levels in different countries in different countries. So thank you very much for this. Mm -hmm. uh, we will proceed uh, uh, with the representative from the European Parliament. Here with us we have uh, Mr. Ivano Kaufin. Uh, coming from Bulgaria, representing the SND group of the European Parliament. Uh, already, as when you entered the room, we noticed that you know quite a lot of people here, which shows the cooperation we have with the youth sector, which is always very much appreciated. And this is why we are very glad to have you here and to hear what would be your perspective of the convention. Thank you. Thank you very much. I also enjoyed this, uh, this interaction, including uh, uh, this uh, conference today. Very much for the invitation. Um, I, I think that uh, what is really needed is uh, to go into into the practical uh, arrangements because uh, I, uh, you are all absolutely convinced that uh, uh, when it comes, uh, especially to policies that affect mostly young people, uh, it's uh, more than normal than, uh, that the young people are consulted, uh, not only but also participating in the decision making. And here we have uh, uh, some things in the European institutions that uh, I think needs to be, need to be changed if uh, we, we are to work on uh, some system for co management uh, of the youth policies. Uh, the first thing is that uh, somehow very often uh, youth policies are uh, very much spread. So you don't have a particular point uh, committee piece of legislation, even despite the fact that we have some youth directly programs, the youth interest is much wider than the youth programs themselves. Uh, so uh, you need a system which is uh, affecting this horizontal uh, So it's, uh, I would say it's not enough just to talk about uh, youth mobility, employment, etc., etc., because uh, issues like environment, like industrial development, uh, like social policies uh, are also affecting uh, young people and uh, the interest of young people. So at least there should be the possibility to present uh, the young people's uh, opinion on this uh, on this issue. So that's the first problem: how to how to structure it. Youth policy is something very horizontal. Case uh, uh, mentioned that there is a youth uh, law in, in Finland. Uh, in Bulgaria, there was a, there is a very long debate over here as whether the youth law is. And uh, uh, all the time it uh, ends with uh, 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 the discovering the fact that actually youth policy cannot be squeezed into one law. Uh, because you need to have something which is horizontal. Uh, with different types of policies, a youth policy. Uh, we have been speaking with Giuseppe on a streamlining. I mean, there is a, a term when it comes to the budget uh, in the European Union, streamlining. For example, in the next seven years, environment issues are going to be Midnight. That means that the, at least the wish is that, that you see them across all the policies. Uh, so that's one of the of the, uh, the possibilities to see youth interests uh, defended in the uh, in the budget of the union. When you you know that for not only for the youth related programs but also for all the programs that are in a way affecting uh, young people, uh, there will be a special attention. Uh, yeah, people again, yeah, the model of stream, the mainstream, uh, sorry, the mainstream uh, uh, environment policy uh, is a good, a good one that, uh, that, uh, that you would uh, use for uh, for young people. Uh, again, to me, uh, the question is also in the in the institutional one. I mean, what is going to be the format? What is going to be the form uh, in which uh, uh, youth organisations uh, would uh, would have a say? Now we have a number of. Uh, different uh, fora for consultations or possibilities for consultations uh, in the committee, uh, in, the, in the commission, in the parliament, also uh, more rarely in the council. But 
motiv megjavt mondjuk a szövegi máson vagy szubjektív engagement and quality szentézik volt. A Kepernsz maga amíg fényleg volt az, hogy állítás és vagy egy kész szóval, hogy itt volt, sometimes itt megjavasni például a reactions, tehát both sides, majd a hit works. Of course, the idea and the ambition should be to create something which is sustainable, it doesn't depend. Especially in the youth field, you have people coming in and leaving the youth organizations, and that's normal. So you need to put in place a system which is able to work afterwards. Completely concerning the budget, I think that when discussing the budgetary policies there should be a debate uh, also in the participation of the, the fair people. And this is not, uh, this should not be only consultation because you have different uh, channels to express your opinion now without any changes. Uh, the thing is whether you can include youth organizations in the decision making. It is more difficult. Of course, you have all these uh, treaty based prerogatives of the different institutions, etc., etc. Uh, but we see indeed a very good example of uh, how it works in the Council of Europe. Uh, so, uh, some elements could be taken and adapted to the treaties and to the, to the construction of, uh, of the European Union. Uh, why not uh, having uh, uh, an obligation from some major committees to make some impact, <coughs> for example, on uh, how? Let's say the budget is going to affect uh, young people. Uh, at least to win the bell, I mean, to, to, to attract uh, the, the, the attention uh, to that. Uh, I just met a colleague who is coming from Bulgaria, actually studying in, in the Netherlands at this moment, working with, uh, with Google, I guess, and such programs. Uh, I'm not sure that in my country, but also in the European Union, you have a very strong concern when uh, the so-called second pillar in the agricultural policy, which is the uh, rural development uh, pillar in this field, what is the youth concern? What is the youth concern in the policies for environment? Uh, what is the youth concern in the policies uh, for, for education? We keep talking about several instruments that are related to youth, and we say this is the youth policy of the European Union. It's not enough. So uh, what I think is that uh, if we speak about co-management, it has to be policy. That means uh, uh, youth organizations have to be in, included in the decision making, and this has to be set somehow in the, in the, in the procedural rules of the institutions. It's going to be easier in the Parliament, maybe easier in the European Commission also. It's going to be more difficult in the, in the Council. As you said, the Council is uh, very jealous. Uh, uh, I can assure you, even for parliamentarians, it's difficult uh, to get uh, and to express an opinion in the Council. Place where the very famous 27, 28 uh, national interests are defended. Uh, but uh, uh, nevertheless, again, in the different institutions, there should be some compulsory formats where uh, youth organizations are actually <coughs> possible with the European Youth Forum uh, to participate uh, not only uh, in consulting but also in decision making. That means to try to achieve some. Uh, and if then it is not possible, then you know other ways. But first, to we'll try to attempt to, 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 to take it from the use of the process. Uh, and that should be a cross party Thank you very much, Professor Kovacs. Uh, thank you very much for this input. I think it was very much encouraging for us. And uh, it is very good to hear that somebody is standing on our side. It's always very positive. Um, we will finish with Giuseppe Mercara, Secretary General of the European Reform. Uh, we heard before already Peter talking, and now we will hear Giuseppe, who is always here in Brussels representing. So. Thank you very much. Uh, I will uh, a bit complement the things that Peter already said, because uh, obviously we are not reinventing uh, the wheel here. However, I will be a little bit more specific with some reflections on, uh, on the EU. Since uh, since this is uh, this is the focus of the panel, um, first of all, the concept of co-management as such is something that at the European Forum, as probably Peter has been already telling you, it's something that we are trying to mainstream in all uh, in all uh, 
uh, institutions that we're working on, so namely uh, not only trying to, to keep it and reinforce it at the Council of Europe, but also to uh, uh, promote it at the UN level, for example, uh, as well as the EU level. When it comes to the EU, the, the task is a little bit uh, challenging. First, because there are certain uh, um, uh, problems in terminology that, that we need to overcome there. Uh, this was one of the first barriers that, uh, that we got when we wanted, for example, within the frame of the structured dialogue, we would call certain parts uh, co-management or co-decision, because they are referring within the EU lexicon to uh, specific processes that exist. When we speak about co-decision in the, in, the, in the European Union, we speak about the process of decisions between the Parliament and the Council. So therefore, uh, the way we use the lexicon and the way we use the word for what we want to achieve uh, has to be a little bit adapted to the situation. And also we have to explain very much uh, uh, to, uh, to the different stakeholders we've been in touch, being them member states, being them uh, commission officials or uh, members of the European Parliament, what we really meant by co-management. And therefore, I wouldn't say that there is no room for co-management at all. We, We've been, uh, I think, uh, already advancing for cer on certain aspects, like the structured dialogue is a good example, but there are other, other examples of uh, sectorial um, initiatives uh, uh, where that, that saw, for instance, taking on board uh, youth organizations as part of the process with certain specific expertise, for example, and thinking about the health. Um, the health campaign that, that was made uh, uh, and years ago that, where sectoral organizations have been involved in, um, in the process via the European Youth Forum. But here I think that we have a broader, uh, a, a broader issue that, that we should take a look at, and um, which is, in general, how we can ensure that the European Union is going to have some more, how to say, uh, some more um, effectiveness in the way speaking with uh, with the youth organizations and in the way speaking with uh, with civil society in general, and that's why I would mention two uh, specific articles of the Lisbon Treaty and the European Youth Forum. We did a study uh, a few years ago when the when the Lisbon Treaty was released to see a little bit which were the impact on youth of the new provisions of the Lisbon Treaty. And the two articles are the Article 11, which is uh, the article that uh, uh, is more known for you probably because uh, of the European Citizens Initiative, but it is also the article that states the fact that the European Union should have a civil dialogue with the, with the, uh, with the organizations and the citizens that represent them, the citizens and the organizations that represent them. When it comes to the civil dialogue, very little I have to say, has been, has been made so far. Uh, the European Youth Forum, we've been working together with other platforms of civil society here in Brussels and with the Economic and Social Committee, for instance, in order to try to push forward a little bit this agenda, because we need to start to look at uh, co-management also in a broader terms and in a broader level about what do we mean as citizens and how we, with this kind of debate of the youth sector, where we're trying to, uh, to push uh, youth organizations of the youth sector of civil society within, within the institutions, how this can contribute for a broader common good and not only trying to look at the sectorial uh, part of the youth organizations as such and trying to see how we can push with the experience that we have, for example the good experience that we have since 40 years at the Council of Europe, trying to bring this experience and trying to advance the way the democratic uh, uh, governance of the Union is, uh, is moving forward. So, uh, I would say, first point, trying to see how, with the civil dialogue, we could actually take it off, this civil dialogue, and what kind of mechanism could sparkle from that. And one of the mechanisms that were foreseen in the treaties were special agreements with, uh, with civil society in terms of uh, how uh, it functions within the Union and, and the civil society organization. And here I have to say that uh, uh, we don't need to reinvent the wheel again. We are the European Youth Forum since uh, the, 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 begin, the, the end of the 70s, uh, when it was still called the Youth Forum of the European Communities, which we have the Youth Forum uh, as a mechanism for having such a direct dialogue. 
However, and this is something that uh, comes back from history, this was one of the claims that our founding fathers in the 70s were trying to negotiate with the Commission already back then. They were trying to get with the Commission a special status where they would have been regularly consulted and regularly uh, taken on board in terms of not only have the Youth Forum as a lobby mechanism, but also have a certain, uh, uh, let's say, uh, a certain consultative power that goes a little bit beyond what it is now, which is, uh, which is a little bit on a dock basis if you take aside the structured dialogue and the youth sector, which is a specific case. So I would say that uh, 35 years after, uh, since in 78 uh, this was happening, we are still there. I think that we should try to see how we could get a more structured thing, because there is, it's true that we get uh, a, a special relationship uh, within the Youth in Action program, because we are, uh, for instance, we are, uh, we are funded by the Youth in Action program, but we don't have a political kind of agreement with, uh, which is a formalized agreement. So uh, we need to struggle for getting Barroso uh, at, the, uh, at our events, which, which we, we eventually get successfully. So I'm, I'm not saying that things are working bad, because actually we are very much heard by uh, the top level of, of the institution. But I think that we can do more and we can uh, uh, recognize more that. The second point, which is uh, the second article I want to mention, which goes uh, a little bit in pair with what I'm saying, is Article 169, uh, or 165, sorry. Article 165, uh, one of the comments uh, is the, uh, the article, the, the comments that uh, uh, speaks about uh, the union promoting youth mobility, youth exchanges, so the basis, the legal basis for the program that we have, as well as the role, and this was an addition that we managed to do in back uh, in 2001, 2002, when there was the European Convention for a Constitution for Europe, which was then failed, the European Youth Forum managed to put inside an addition to it, saying that, if you look at the, at the article, saying that uh, the Union recognized the role of young people in building a democratic Europe which is not a small thing, because uh, uh, it means that uh, uh, we as youth organizations and young people in general have a specific role in building uh, uh, the European Union. So I think that using a little bit more and exploding a little bit more these two articles, even if we not bring us to the co-management system as uh, uh, it is envisaged in the Council of Europe, can definitely bring us a little bit ahead on the work that we have to do all together in order to get our voice more structurally heard. Thank you very much. Thank you, Giuseppe. I think that's, again, a deep inside story on also what has happened so far will help a lot to participants, especially in the afternoon when they will be joining the waiting group. Um, luckily, we have a bit more time than we had uh, after the first panel, so uh, please use this a uh, unique opportunity for the people we have here uh, uh, um, to ask uh, for yourself, for your organizations, whatever you were wondering, and also two comments on the, on the things we have presented today. So I will again go with the first three questions. Don't be shy. Yes. No, I just had actually two questions. One is more of a verification of what you said. Actually, on uh, for young people to represent the voice of young people, according to you, in which 
European institution would be uh, less, like more, not less not feasible to have it, according to the situation we, we have now, so more council, more commission, according to the, or parliament, according to the, also the power of each one of the institutions, so bit, your opinion on how it could be feasible, implement, like the implementation could be a bit more feasible. Uh,
important to have, uh, say, the, the very beginning, the very first stage, uh, when the Commission is making and or is supposed to make public consultations about the pieces of legislation that it is suggesting, and they are the only ones to have the initiative, uh, the, 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 the legal initiative. Uh, and then you have uh, different positions, but mostly this is called decision between the Council and the Parliament. Again, uh, I'm more skeptical about the Council, knowing how it works, although I would encourage you very much uh, through the national governments also to, uh, to try to be heard through the national uh, the European Council. Uh, but the other institution is the Parliament. And I think that the Parliament is the very natural place uh, where young people uh, should uh, have the possibility to express uh, uh, their opinion on pieces of legislation or other decisions that, uh, that uh, are concerned, uh, that, uh, that concern their, uh, their interests. Uh, how to do that? Uh, it has to do with, uh, with also the, the capacity of the youth organization to, to follow the legislative process and the legislation. Uh, I wouldn't uh, probably uh, uh, give us a good example, although I think that these institutions are doing a good job, the Committee of Regions and the uh, Economic and Social Council that have some consultative functions when, when decisions are taken, they are following the legislation, they are sending their opinions, they are insisting on that, although this is, uh, this is also uh, with a bit of a lobby type of, uh, of work, despite the fact that they are set by the, by the European institutions. I don't think that the youth uh, organizations need uh, this uh, huge administration and uh, an expert following everything which is, uh, which is presented. But uh, you could participate in some key, uh, key, uh, key points. For example, when adopting uh, the legislative program of the European Commission, what are going to be the pieces of legislation that are going to be adopted and uh, whether the interests of young people are uh, Covered there. Uh, you uh, would ask uh, for the possibility uh, for pieces of legislation that you find of interest through your representatives, uh, through your organizations, uh, that you express an opinion on that. And this opinion is formally uh, presented also, let's say, to the committee in the parliament, which is, which is working on this piece of legislation. Uh, again, on your own initiative, where you think that uh, that would be. Uh, that would I think that what we have in the Parliament is a youth intergroup, which is creating for, creating for the first time this legislature, is also a very good, uh, good opportunity because there you have uh, members of Parliament from different political groups working in different committees. And if the youth intergroup takes some initiative, then it has the possibility to go horizontally to the various committees of the Parliament. And this is a place also to interact. Uh, the youth organizations with the uh, with, uh, with, uh, youth interview. So uh, I think that these are the, the decisive points where the youth voice has to be heard when uh, you prepare what is going to be the legislation and then in the process of, of adoption of the legislation so that the youth voice is heard. Thank you. Um, we'll have also short take too much of your time, but I wanted to say something about uh, the concept and practice of crew management based on the Council of Experience. Uh, first of all, I think it's very important that young people have opinion and not only heard, but taken into account. This is the basis for the uh, Just consulting young people or citizens, it's not democracy. It's not enough, in my opinion. Now, in the Council of Europe, if you remember what I said this morning, there are three, in, when we talk about crew management, we have three important dimensions. The first is consultation. We have an advisory council, which is consulted. We also have the governmental body, which is being consulted. It is important because when you co decide, like we do in the council of Europe, and if you don't agree, what is the result? In most cases, is that the consensus is there is one of the lowest, the common denominator. So it is important, I think, that youth organizations have also the freedom to express their views and to play as a contract cover in a way. I think this is important. So co-management are limited only to co decisions in my opinion is not enough. And then we have a third element of co-management in Europe, it's this dimension of monitoring. Because it's not enough to co-design, but it's very 
important to follow up because usually where democracy doesn't work is not so not always at the level of decision, but at the level of implementation. And in the Council of Europe, I have to say that this is a very positive sign that the co management is able to monitor, to control, and to ensure that the decisions are implemented. So that's why this co management, uh, this morning, uh, um, Mr. Jean said that we have to, to, to be clear on what we mean by co management. In the Council of Europe, it's this trial of co management, consultation, co decision, and monitoring. This is very important.